And he drives one deep to left center field. Back in the gap goes Weaver looking up. And it's out of here. Peter Lanza with his second home run of the day. A two-run shot to put the... Hey, everyone. Welcome back to episode 154 of the Shea Station podcast. You know, we didn't have to talk about a sweep until September of last season. And this year, we're talking about it in our second episode of the regular season. The Mets go to Milwaukee, sort of a house of horrors for them. They lose three in a row, two in pretty embarrassing fashion, and they head back for their home opener, which was canceled today and moved to tomorrow. I'm one of your co-hosts, Jack, a.k.a. Jolly. Joining me in New York, where I'm not, sadly, is Jerry Blevins. That's my bet. Jerry, how you doing, man? I'm good. Uh, yeah, it's weird because the the sweep, they it, it felt like was never going to happen last year and this team <laughs> i feel is built better yeah than last year's team uh and they look like crap this second series so there's that <laughs> and the I mean, weather it looks amazing outside i was gonna <laughs> say like we're just talking about it like i i heard that there was like rain at 5 p.m but it's 70 and sunny out right now so i don't really know where they got that from but they could use an off day i think sure i think that's the key they just need that off day yeah, so not a lot of good stuff to report from this series, both like on and off the field. We had some more injury scares. We had really poor pitching performances and bad hitting. And uh, the kids on the farm are doing well. We'll get to that in a little bit. But I think I'll, I'll run through this recap pretty quick. I don't think anyone wants to revel in it too much because, like I said, not too much good Let's stuff. Let's bust through it. Well, before I do, Jerry, I got to tell you about today's sponsor, which, as always, is DraftKings. Guys, I hope that you did not place a bet on the Mets this past series, because if you did, you probably did not come out a winner. But baseball season is underway, and there's plenty of good bets to be had, and you can do all of that at the DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, you can place a $5 bet on any pregame Moneyline wager and get $150 in bonus bets if your team wins. You can take that bonus bet money, spread it out over a same-game parlay, combine multiple bets to see if you can get an even bigger payout at the end of the day download their free and easy to use app now use code shay s-h-e-a and get and bet just five dollars and get 150 dollars in bonus bets if that bet cashes minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply see show notes for details thank you to them for sponsoring today's episode and any resources you might need for gambling help are listed down below as always jerry are you ready for this very sad recap <laughs> i'm gonna just <laughs> tune you out for a little bit I'm just gonna put the computer on mute it's perfect <laughs> All right, Jack, hit that funky music in post, which I can't hear right now. The Mets go down to Miller Park. No, it's American Family Field. I got that wrong last episode. With high hopes, a 3-1 and one record, the Mets stroll into town. They were only down one to nothing at the end of three innings. Cookie was looking good. Four strikeouts through three at that point. And then Brian Anderson, big bad Brian Anderson, who loves facing NL East teams, got his first of many home runs in the fourth of this game with a two-run bomb. 3 nothing Brewers. Cookie didn't have a good day in his first start of the season he exited after four plus it was a disappointing debut five earned runs allowed four hits four walks four strikeouts and the one home run did get 12 whiffs which was nice but he did see a sizable dip in his velocity which he said was not a concern because he felt fine so there's that tommy hunter we loved him in spring training we loved him in his first outing of the season this one not so much. He implodes. He lets the game get out of hand. Two singles and two walks run up the score to six to nothing. And then Bryce Terang, the kid, cranks a grand slam for his first major league home run. Tommy allows five earned runs and hits the IL with back spasms. Hopefully we see him again soon and healthy at that point. Luis Guillorme, the poor man Shohei Otani, got another pitching appearance in this one through a scoreless inning because, of course, he did. I think that's three in the past three years, so good for Luis. But the Mets, they get just three hits and six walks against Freddie Peralta and Bryce Wilson. They lose this one 10 to nothing, a big come down from the high of winning the series in Miami. And it only gets worse, guys, because they didn't win, they didn't win game two either. There, even with Max Scherzer on the bump against Wade Miley. Two runs in the first inning off, you guessed it, a Brian Anderson hit. This one was a double. But after that, Scherzer and Miley traded zeros through the fifth inning. The Mets got base runs. The Mets got base runners in all but one of these innings. They failed to score every single time. That was a consistent theme throughout this series. Scherzer in the sixth inning again kind of imploded, kind of struggled as he got deeper into this game. He allows three home runs in a row to Rowdy Telez, Brian Anderson, I'm saying that name a lot, and Garrett Mitchell. Five and a third innings, five earned runs, eight hits, three home runs, and two walks allowed for Max Scherzer in this start. Brooks Raley struggled as well. He allowed a three-run homer to 
Brian Anderson, you guessed it right, at home. Two homers and six RBI in this game for him. Garrett Mitchell gets another one too, because why not? It's 10 to nothing, Brew Crew. The Mets went hitless in just two innings of this game, but they could not muster a single run. McNeil and Nimmo both have three hits. The rest of the lineup goes two for 27. The Mets lose 10 to nothing. And now this game three becomes dire because they need to win it. And Corbin Burns is on the mound. It kind of spelled danger for the Mets, but suddenly the bats wake up in the first inning. Marte gets hit by a pitch, steals a base, and Francisco Lindor doubles him home in the first. David Peterson had some trouble with control in this game. He allowed a walk, double, single, and a Joey Weimer three-run homer to give the Brewers a 4-1 to lead. But then later on, Marte doubles, Lindor singles him home, and Alonzo, without his Tom Selleck, leaves the yard. He crushes a two-run homer to tie it 4-4 to in the third inning. He gets him again later for his second home run of the game, another two-run homer in the fifth three home runs in his last four plate appearances against Corbin Burns but David Peterson didn't have it this start four innings pitch five earned runs five hits five walks that's a lot of walks 92 pitches there he allowed a walk in all but one inning he never got a one two three inning hopefully we see a better version of him next time out Drew Smith would allow the game tying double to make it a six six game in the fifth on his 30th birthday early settler and pri pirate ship captain John Curtis twirls two innings of scoreless relief for the Mets pen so good for him happy birthday man uh, David Robertson tosses a scoreless eighth, but then Adam Adovino comes in for the ninth, works it to a full count against Garrett Mitchell, and throws a slider that does not slide. Instead, it gets cranked to right field for a walk-off solo home run. The Brewers win 7-6. to six. They sweep this series, and the Mets offense and pitching staff are going to be looking for answers in this series against Miami. Yuck. Yuck. That was Good gross. Work, but, but yuck. Yeah. Yuck. It's like it kind of all fell apart. Um Starting pitching, David Peterson, I want to talk about real quick. Yeah. Uh, fastball uh, location. That's 100% been the problem, I think. Because um, he's, I, I was really enjoying some of the sequences him and Narvaez were doing and watching him. And Narvaez was like, all right, like, let's go. Let's go. Let's hit this spot. If you hit this spot up and in, it's strike three. And he just couldn't do it. Uh, it's kind of a continuation from his first start where he escaped some of those big jams, mm. uh, but he only had one walk, but he did fall behind. Uh, just a continuation, man. And so hopefully he he finds that fastball command. I think he might just be overthrowing it and, and overthinking it and just letting it, trusting it in the zone again. Um, but that's worrisome. Uh, yeah. And then Max Scherzer, the sixth inning. There was a lot of talk on the broadcast about, like, I think it was it was Keith talking about the conditioning of the pitchers and maybe they need to run. Like I'm not for that. You're not going to question their, their conditioning. No offense to Keith, but every player is in better shape than they were in the eighties. Like it's just not the truth. Again, maybe some of the young guys need to do some running, but I, I literally said to Max Scherzer, uh, I went and chatted with him in the outfield and he was running. And I was like, man, I'm so happy to be retired watching you run because it because the dude is an animal. And again, right. it is old school to go running, but uh, I don't think that's it. I think it's I think it's just I don't know what it is, but he's looked sharp, but he didn't look sharp in the sixth inning again. So I, I expect him to overcome that. So the the conditioning thing, I, I hope that doesn't become a narrative because that's not fun to talk about. And that's yeah. not fun. That's like questioning somebody's work ethic. Right. Uh, you don't want to do that for Max Scherzer. A Tyler O'Neill hustle, you know what I mean? That's like a one of those mess. Oh my God. <laughs> we can talk about other teams' messes too. That'd be nice. Yeah. But yeah. uh yeah, but uh, in other words, like Lindor looked solid. Uh Guillaume looked great. Pete Alonso hit two homers. Like he's on a yeah, heater, Peter hopefully. On, Peter on a heat. I have my great gray one over here. <laughs> there you go. We can uh, Yeah, but outside of that, like it just wasn't pretty. No, just not pretty. I mean, it the, begins the and ends too. with the pitching staff, I was going to say. Yep. I mean, Cookie, you know, had a good first time through the order, I think, had the velocity dip, and hopefully he can overcome that. Uh, he's going to face a Miami team, which he pitched really it, explain well. In the last year. Explain the velocity dip to me uh, for, the, for the listeners. Like, where was he? Where did he get to? I mean, so – I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't notice it during the game. I noticed it after the game from quotes from Cookie and reporters asking him because Cookie does not overpower people normally with his velocity at this point in his career. He's never really thrived on that in the first place. I want to check his peripheral from last year because I'm pretty sure fastball velocity. Yeah, he was in the 41st percentile last year. He's not one of the 
flamethrowers of the game right now, but it's a noticeable dip. He sat at 91 uh, in his start against Milwaukee. Last year, he sat at 93 on his four-seam fastball. So a two-mile-per-hour dip in velocity is alarming, especially from one year to the other with not much time in between and not an injury in between because Cookie's been mostly healthy since the start of 2022. So I think it's a little bit alarming, but it's kind of reassuring knowing that he himself feels fine. Um, so I'm hopefully he, this is something they can work around or adjust to, or maybe it's just a part of ramping up for him at this point in his career. Uh, but I think that was definitely a key in why that outing didn't go very well for him. Yeah. Um, I think it might've just been a little bit of inactivity Yeah, because he had that long layoff. Um, but he was, yeah, 93, 94 last year. And it works out perfectly for him because they were only asking him to, to throw five innings right? and then we'll take care of the rest out of the bullpen. So when he can push it to 93, 94, his fastball plays up a little bit. And we all know how how good he's capable of putting the ball in location. So it was a, not alarming, uh, but it was noticeable. And it became, you know, 91 flat versus 93 with some zip, 94. It, it's different. So uh, I expect him to bounce back. But yeah. it kind of just all went together. So. Yeah, there were a couple moments in the first couple of games where I think the Mets maybe could have turned the tide and gotten a couple of things going. I remember there was a Nito at bat with two runners on. Nimmo had three hits to that point. You could have bunted, put a couple guys in runners in scoring position for him. Nito, uh, Nimmo tapped one to the other side. That would have been a run there. I Just anything to get any sort of momentum going would have been beneficial to this team. They had a fully rested bullpen, like you mentioned, uh, for game one, where they only need a cookie to go five. And it was just the choice of Tommy Hunter first that kind of set the game off completely. Um, so a couple of things just really didn't go the Mets way. You know, we mentioned Scherzer's sixth inning. It's kind of the same start as his first start. Once he got to the sixth, things kind of fell apart. But before that, besides his fastball getting hit around a little bit, he looked, you know, like Max Scherzer for the most part. Uh, it's that third game that I think hurts a little bit because, you know, you get the effort against Corbin Burns. The bats finally wake up, especially Lindor, who we've been kind of waiting to see have a good game. He, he gets three hits in this game and it goes to the wayside because of the bullpen, the bullpen. And of course, David Peterson, who couldn't really uh, control his pitches for the first four innings, but Drew Smith allowing the double, you know, let the game tie there. Uh, you get a great effort out of John Curtis, which kind of gets wasted too. two shutout innings out of him is fantastic. He's only allowed the one home run and has otherwise been great this season. And then out you know, was making good pitches, but that last pitch was just one that didn't, you know, clear the plate at all. It was right in Mitchell's hot zone uh, on the inside part. And he just crushed it. And I mean, the Brewers, Got a lot of young kids that can crush baseballs. They could be a very exciting team this year. We could look back on this series and say, yeah, you know what? That kind of makes sense. But hopefully the Mets can overcome this and get something going with this off day now. Yeah, yeah. The Brewers might be something. I, I'm still, gosh, I don't want to root for the Brewers because uh, the way oh, they yeah. treated Burns and trading Hater when you're trying to, I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, hopefully it's just a blip. Again, we – we were talking about Lindor and him playing great defense, but not hitting. And he had some good ABs in Miami and he got some, some knocks like on command. It was so, that was pretty good. Um, that did stink when you're like, finally, where we break out against Burns, get him out early. And then just, you know, seeing out give up uh, the walk off. I was like, no, I was I mean, in the airport, you know, watching it going oh crap By the way, I, did get, I did get blacked out when i landed wow in New York. of course <laughs> like, you did of course. unreal <laughs> so, uh, I, I listened to howie and, and keith rad so keith rad want to say has been doing a good job drove back from the warehouse the other day was listening to him he was taking play-by-play -play for the inning sounded great did a great job very happy with how he's doing so go far. dayton flyers keith rad wow another one love that good for you. Yeah, right. a lot of pride there love that uh, no, i mean in, when i was in the um at the alt site in 21 like uh with the in brooklyn he was there and i was like oh shoot and then he gets the call like so cool. yeah. good for him and he is he is good I was going to say my, I think my dad was listening. I forget who was talking to me about this, but they said that they thought it was still Wayne because they kind of sound familiar, like kind of alike in a way. And they do. They have a, a similar cadence. Um, yeah. I enjoyed him and, and uh, how he's kind of back and forth a little bit Yeah. where when Howie would come on, Keith would do like, this is not what people want to hear right now, but uh, <laughs> it was, uh, he was, he was playing like the color, which is perfect. Yeah, so I, yeah. I was proud. I, I shot him a DM. I was like, Hey, way to go, man. I was listening to you. So hell yeah.
Um, I think you hit the nail on the head, though, with the the Burns comment you made before, because I forgot to mention this in my run through. But the Mets offense, after knocking out Burns, getting, you know, six runs on him, which is massive. They go hitless in four and two thirds innings after that against the Brewers bullpen, which we mentioned, I think, in our probables last time. The Brewers bullpen always finds a way. They definitely yeah. found a way in this series. They own the Mets as soon as they uh, came in. A positive is they had runners on like every basically every inning for the whole yeah. series and just couldn't knock them in so there there were there is that right. um they'll just you know again this is a new year man they're they got to find their identity who they yeah. are what they're going to do i am worried about the rotation in the short term but not in the long term it is yeah. putting some pressure on on singa to to kind of be a steadying presence especially with Scherzer are getting knocked out in the sixth twice like that with peterson kind of being inconsistent with his with his command um tyler mcgill looked great last time which will will need him um i am a little bit worried about this first you know first month of of how it's going to shape out i hope the 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 braves and the phillies don't take off and get out of the gates but even if they do it's not over like we remember from 21 oh i was gonna say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'll shout out salicata um <laughs> but yeah, man, it's 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 just it, it's baseball and they look like crap and they got outplayed. So, yeah, they got outplayed. I think Linda yeah, was going to say that it happens. You know, yeah. it happens and it's it's going to continue to happen at some point this year. Uh, it's worth mentioning what you talked about with the starting rotation. You know, they had 13 to third innings in this uh, series. They allowed 15 earned runs, five home runs, 11 walks. And, you know, Sanga and McGill were kind of the two that came out of the Miami series, both with probably the best starts of the series. They both won their starts and there is pressure on them. And it's going to be tough because now they're getting dealt a tough hand to face the exact same lineup again, who just saw them a week ago. And that's always kind of a tougher thing for starting pitchers uh, to endure. And the Mets, yeah, you mentioned with this April, like it doesn't really get easier from here. They have this Marlins series, which they should pick up, hopefully. Uh, and then they welcome the Padres back to City Field, which was, you know, a terrible series last time we saw them here and then they have their 10 game west coast road trip in the middle of april they get the day off on the 13th then it's 10 games on the west before another day off on the 24th and then you end the month with the nationals and the braves so yeah like you said i mean hopefully there's not too much ground to make up at the end of this month but the uh, braves just swept the cardinals in a very impressive series for them so maybe we'll do a little role reversal this year maybe we'll be 10 and a half back maybe we'll <laughs> Be nice. I don't think it's going to be that drastic, but no. but it could be because uh, they still have to kind of find their footing a, as yeah. a group. You know, um, I wanted to shout out Starling Marte uh, mm. before we do, you know, the Apple, because it's he's not on the list. He only had two hits, but he had a big stolen base. Yeah. Like a knock, a stolen base. And then Lindor knocked him in like that's dynamic. That's what he does. I expect to see a lot of it. Uh, he's got three bags so far. Leads um, the National League. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> by the way i was looking at i was somebody said uh, something about ricky henderson came up the first guy to do something since ricky henderson yeah uh it was like a volpe tweet oh first. okay yeah whatever the case may be but uh, let me pull it up ricky henderson i was like man they asked him how many <laughs> bags how many bags he would steal yeah uh i'm not sure what he said but ricky I mean, henderson Vol go ahead I mean, Volpe has a real shot of getting 30 to 40 this year if he plays the whole year. Kid's fast. So in 1998 with the mm -hmm. Oakland A's, Ricky Henderson was 39 years old. He played in 152 games, and he stole 66 bases <laughs> at 39 <laughs> years old. Is that good? He, also, he led the good. league. He led MLB with 66, and he also walked 118 times and led the league in that. <laughs> he, he had an OPS of uh, – 723 there i mean the next, the next year, year he was a met he, had, he was a met at 40 he only played in 120 games but his ops was 889 for the mets and at 40 years old <laughs> 37 stolen bases at 40 years that's got to be the most by a 40 year old ever oh <laughs> rajay wanted to push him rajay wanted yeah. to make it that far um i think he could have done it but again what a what a freak ricky henderson was <laughs> Is. hopefully if Marte can even give us 30 this year I'll be I'll be very happy about that he's on a good pace right now he looks much more comfortable out there um I really I really think that 40 is in the realm of possibilities I love it I mean up. 47 was not that long ago it was 2021 that's not that yeah. far in the rearview mirror so I mean no, I think I think 40 is on the horizon um yeah. so I think I think that would 
that would help the Mets score runs because you don't need two hits anymore. Like yes. you just need him to get on, steal a base, and then just one hit. So anyway. No, I mean, it's it's worth mentioning because, I mean, that's a dynamic you can work with for the rest of the season. If Lindor hits and Marte finds his way on base, that's one-two punch that works every time. Uh, kind of takes the run scoring pressure off Pete Alonso too, which we're always kind of searching for. And Nimmo's, what? you know, Nimmo's stolen a base. Lindor has stolen a base. LeCastro's always leaning in and stealing a base. So, you know, there's avenues there. What What's your take on Guillaume playing, um, getting in at third base against righties? Do you think this is going to be a platoon now? Or do you think it's just kind of given Eduardo a, a mental day off? You know, I thought the mental day in the first game would mean that he would play the other two, but he got benched twice in the series, um, which is a little concerning. Uh, I think it kind of kind of tells us what the plan might be in the short term, at the very least, until we see maybe even just one big game from Eduardo Escobar. Because uh, Guillaume, you know, took some good at-bats here. I know he did have, I think, four four threes in the, the last game there, just rolling over to second. Um, but Guillaume is a useful piece for this team. He made some really nice plays at third base, too, and that's something that Escobar doesn't always offer you in the field. Uh, and the Mets kind of have to ponder it because, you know, if Escobar is going to be dead weight in the lineup you need to find a plus somewhere else and that could be Luis Guillorme if he's up here you might as well play him so I don't hate the idea but it might be short term yeah I think it might be a, a hot hand kind of thing yeah. an approach to you know uh Guillorme is going to get out there you need him his glove is unbelievable um and if he's hitting you ride him if not let Escobar come back out and then if he's banging keep him in for a long time if not they're going to go back and forth and kind of see so it, it's it, it's interesting yeah, I mean, the Mets will get Trevor Rogers in the next series, so that's a righty Escobar day. I'm sure he'll start that day. Uh, but you, it's not like you can't ever play him from the left side. You know, we saw that in September. You can really hit from there once he's right. Uh, so hopefully one big game kind of gets him going. Uh, speaking of one big game that didn't get somebody going, Mark Canna, who looked great in the Miami series, uh, was 0 for in this series, 0 for 12 with three strikeouts. We didn't see much of Tommy Pham or Timmy LaCastro, so that could be maybe some sort of platoon they're going soon because maybe they could warrant some more playing time i think fam is still kind of the left-handed pitching guy the dh option top of the lineup whatever the bets want to do um and hopefully canna just heats up again because he's been sort of streaky for pretty much the entirety of his mets career so far yeah i can see canna has got to be your guy he's still he did it last year he's, yeah he's fine uh he only struck out three times in 12 at bats still high for him but yeah uh, LaCastro is a bench piece. He's an outfield replacement runner. He's not going to take some time, but Tommy Pham needs to be talked about because he, he looked great. He needs his ABs. They, they told him he was going to get him. He, to me, he's like uh, a step above Guillaume as yeah. in not, not a full defensive replacement, but, um, bring some more offensively than, than what Luis does, but not as good defensively, you know? So, to me, Guillaume and Fam have to find at bats somewhere in there. So, yeah, definitely agree. Uh, do you want to get to our very thin selection for Apple of our eye? Yeah, the Apple of our eyes. You know, I don't. The think... Apple is. Uh, it's a. It's still. It's like a crab apple. We didn't have to worry about this last year. I don't think we ever had a situation up until the end of the season where we had to give an apple during like a sweep or like a really bad <laughs> series. Um, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you take uh, it. Yeah, away. I'll go first. I yeah. almost gave it to Guillaume for throwing that inning as well. He went two for eight with, mm -hmm. a, with a zero from the mound, like yep. shout out Guillaume, but I'm going to go with my man, Francisco Lindor. Uh, you're the apple of my eye. Great defense, good leadership. He answered the call. Uh, he did say, you know, they outplayed us. You know, we got to be better. I still believe in this team, uh, mm -hmm. but we have to win some ball games. Uh, yep. Lindor said, he went three for nine with two doubles, two RBI, two walks. Like he's just, he's playing a complete game of baseball. It doesn't stand out like he went eight for 10 with four homers this series, which he's capable of having hot streaks like that. Yeah. But that steady presence, and that's what you want that consistency. Uh, it was nice to see him break out offensively because he's had good at bats, but to see him continue uh, getting some knocks. Yeah, definitely agree, I, especially with him having good at-bats even before that breakout game. It kind of felt like it was always there and just kind of waiting to happen. And uh, pretty funny that it happened against Corbin Burns, of all people. But I think that's a good apple. I'm going to give mine to the guy right behind him, and that's Pete Alonzo, the guy on my shirt. Peter on a heater, shop.johnboymedia.com. You know the deal. 
Uh, Pete Alonso didn't have a crazy stat line. He only went two for 12 this series, but both of those two were two run homers off a guy that won Cy Young two years ago. Uh, Alonzo, I think it was all in the mustache. I think he was trying to try something new to start the season. It didn't work. He got rid of it, and then he looked like his normal self. So that means he's going to have two home runs every game for the rest of the season. That's what that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> Shout out. Uh, he also <laughs> went back to the axe handle bat. He did, yes. Yeah, so he went to the Marucci like hit lab, which is like uh, they're trying to do the the pitcher ver- or the hitter version of what the pitchers do. Right. It's not there yet, but it helped Taylor Arenado. He had that like big hockey puck disc for yeah. balance on the bat to for his ideal swing, whatever that looks like. Like the science for hitting is still kind of philosophical. I think, isn't Riley one of the guys too? Had something with yeah, like his Riley, batting well, gloves. He, he, he was talking to. Uh, I think Arenado and Goldschmidt yeah. they were like, hey, what, what's going on? What's that bat? And he's like, yeah. look, I went to Marucci in the offseason. Riley went, uh, and so did Pete, and he tried the hockey puck. He might go back to it at some point because it's a long season, and right. you don't have a full week of prep. Sometimes it'll feel different in your hand. Anyway, went back to the axe handle, shaved the mustache. That combination resulted in two home runs. Is baseball the most superstitious sport? It's got to be. It, it has to be because yeah. you play every day. <laughs> And you're like, all right, well, yesterday I got a hit doing this. Now, mm. why wouldn't I do that? And if you don't, <laughs> if you don't do that and you don't get a hit, you're like, I sh- what an idiot. Like, why know, didn't man. I do that? Like, Seems it, so it's obvious. Just, <laughs> it's when you're there every day, it, it, you know, baseball players and humans in general are creatures of habit. Yeah. And so if it's good, you do it. If it's not good, you change it up. That's, that's, it's simple as that. And I, I definitely agree. I am, uh, I'm not like, Turk Wendell, where I'm going to brush my teeth <laughs> in between innings because of that, or whatever the case may you be. You can rock a shark gonna... tooth right there. That'd be good. I, I mean, I did have a cool shark tooth uh, yeah? as a as a youth. You know, uh, okay. I thought it was cool, <laughs> and I actually, my wife got me a a charm that's like not a real shark tooth, but a you know, very intimidating. I don't, I don't know where it is. Uh, <laughs> don't um, tell her that. But it looks cool. She she knows it's oh, it's okay. a thing. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think baseball is just has to be superstitious because you you it's repetitive. Yeah, so definitely um, a much more compelling apple of our eye probably would have came if we got to talk about the kids on the farm who are all ranking at Triple A right now. Uh, some of them joining the major league club, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, Brett Beatty had an injury scare with the right index finger uh, that he or was it right thumb right thumb that he hurt last year right thumb yeah uh turns out it's not any ligament damage or structural damage so he's just day to day and he's been ranking six for 15 two homers and five rbi down at triple a right now with an obp near 500 in fact he's not the only one with two home runs ronnie mauricio's got two along with eight hits and six rbi and francisco alvarez has two of his own he's four for 16 on the year and mark viento is doing well too uh do you want to talk about any one of these guys in particular? Uh, yeah, because uh, Alvarez is here because of the possibility of uh, of Omar Narvaez hitting the IL because right. of his calf, who's, by the way, looked amazing. I know. It's Narvaez tough. has looked so good. Uh, also behind the dish, like getting to see him work regularly, watching how he's working with the pitchers, where he puts his target, like super impressed. Yep. Uh, a good sign. Uh, but if he's out, Francisco Alvarez could come in and continue that hot bat. Um, that'd be great. Another cup of, you know, cup of coffee for him would be nice. Uh, but outside of that, man, those guys, they're, they're just doing what they do. I, I'm Ronnie Mauricio is just killing it. Monster. Brett Beatty's, I, I worry about that thumb with Beatty, but he's continued to not just, not just hit homers, but get on base, yeah. walk, the walks wow. are the biggest thing for me because that was kind of an issue uh, with his game as long, along with the defense that both kind of seem like they're becoming strengths at this point in his young career, which is really, really cool. To me, that's that's a sustainability plus because like his approach at the plate, it's not all swing and miss. It's not all all or nothing. Like He's got a polished approach and eye for the game, allowing the people behind him to hit, which is all of what this Mets lineup is about. So he'll be able to, you know, keep the line moving, turn the lineup over. Uh, he is, <laughs> if he, if he didn't get like this little injury scare and continue to hop bat, and we saw some of the, you know, Eduardo Escobar continue to not play well. 
uh, he could have he could have been here in April. We'll see. It's still a yeah. possibility. Um, but the the thumb I think did say, all right, we'll just slow that down. So we'll yeah, see. it's it's really interesting how quickly things change. Because uh, last episode, which was I think last week, um, all the talk was about how, when are we going to see Beatty? Is Escobar struggle for real? And we even mentioned Francisco Alvarez, and he's the one that's with the team now uh, for this potential Narvaez injury and could be playing, you know, maybe tomorrow on opening day, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's the way that's baseball. Like we yeah. we talked about, uh, what are we going to do in our rotation with the the depth pieces? Is this and then. <laughs> Baseball has a way of, of even if you do have a plan of saying, slow down a little bit, we got different thing in mind for you. Yeah. And speaking of that rotation, Justin Verlander underwent an MRI on Wednesday. He's got reduced inflammation with that Terrace major, uh, which is good. He's going to continue throwing like he has been. So hopefully it's sort of closer to a return. There's still no real timetable on it, but it seems encouraging. Yeah. So it's basically like what they're doing is working. They've continued to throw, but they're not pushing it uh the inflammation is down and i expect him to start ramping it up sometime really soon yeah. and if everything stays the same he'll he'll push through so uh yeah. no timetable because they're just going about it then we don't need to know everything yeah i think some people perceive no timetable as the mets have no idea where it's more like you know we just have to take it day by day and eventually this will just kind of yeah dissolve. they have an idea of what they're going to do but it's like uh 50 50 on if it's going to work early and if it doesn't they don't want to set a timetable of what could be yes. and it doesn't show up and then that's a new talking point for for us yeah it's not like i mean scherzer's oblique strain we knew exactly when he'd be back last year because that's just such a common injury and there's such a concrete timetable for it whereas this thing is you know i didn't know what the terrorist major was until you told me that's basically the gist of it. So You're welcome. Like Simpson, yeah, I know. I'm telling everyone, you know, my partner, Jerry Blutmans, he educated me. <laughs> and uh, uh, Tommy Hunter hits yeah, the IL. That rounds that out. Yeah, that's that stinks. He, he yeah. looked great. Um, yeah, and back spasm, which is, you know, he's had a yeah, couple the herniated of discs. Yeah. yeah, and so hopefully it's nothing. Hopefully yeah. it's, uh, I have a little bit of spasms and they're like, well, we need some help anyway. Why don't you just get your rest? I think that might be kind of what's happening, but we'll see. Hope so. Uh, so that's all the mostly bad news, but some good news sprinkled in there. Ahead of the first home series of the year where we welcome back the Miami Marlins. Uh, barely forgot you. We just played you. Jared, you want to tell me who is pitching in those games? I do, but I want to start off with, most importantly, who's not pitching? The names, Sandy Alcantara and Jesus Lazardo, the two big names uh, who dominated the Mets for the most part last series. Uh, we don't get them. We also get to dodge Jazz Chisholm. Why? Slid into second base yesterday. Uh, his head collided with, I think it was, I forget who Shin it was on the Twins, but he's going to take a few days off. I think it's something with his shoulder as well. Yeah, they, he kind of impacted weird sliding into second base. Uh, he got picked off, but took off. And then anyway, so we're going to miss Jazz, Sandy, and Luzardo, which is good news, hopefully, for the Mets offense, who's been stagnant. In game one, the home opener, Tyler McGill, 1-0, a 3.6 ERA, did well his last start against those uh, Marlins. He struck out seven in five innings, a two-run ball, had a big uh, line drive caught by Francisco Lindor to end his outing that was spectacular. He's going against Eduard Cabrera, who has a four-and-a-half ERA. Um, Cabrera walked six batters in four innings and a 6-2 loss to those Mets. Uh, Nick Fortes hit a two-run homer. Arias went three for three against McGill in their last ma matchup, and he's continued to hit. I think he's in 450 territory. Ooh. That that guy's a thorn in our side. The ironic, if not uh, you know, the opposite end of what uh, Jeff McNeil does to opposing fans. I was going to say Luis Arias <laughs> is doing to Mets fans. So uh, love to see it. Don't love to see it against your own team. Mm -hmm. That is game one. Game two, Kodai Singa and the Ghost Fork, which looks spectacular after a shaky first inning. He settled into a beautiful thing. He's 1-0 against those Marlins with a 1-6-9 ERA. He went five and a third with that one earned run in the first three hits, three walks, and eight Ks. At one point, retiring 12 in a row. Uh, he's going against Trevor Rogers, the lefty you spoke of. He's 0-1 with a 6-2-3 capable of doing great things but they they had the Mets had eight base runners against him last time out they had people all over the place uh and then drove in some of those runs that is game two 
And the game three, the deciding game, Cookie Carrasco, who had a rough first outing, below down, looking to bounce back against, to be determined. We don't know who's going to face off because the Marlins don't know who might start. It might be Braxton Garrett, who was a starter, non-starter. He's their swing man, their Trevor Williams, if you will. Uh, Miami Sunday starter will replace Johnny Cueto, who sadly was injured. One of my favorite players still in the game today. Uh, Carrasco allowed those five earned runs in four innings in Milwaukee. But last year against Miami, he was three and one in five starts with a 3.14, 27 strikeouts to seven walks. So he does have a good history. Look at the bounce back. Marlins, Mets, home opener. Let's do it again, baby. And uh, your coworker and friend of us outside of uh, Clover Park who said hi to us, Annie Martino, basically just hinted or I guess kind of tried to confirm uh, that it is going to be Omar Narvaez on the I.L. and Francisco Alvarez is expected to be active for the home opener, might even start that game, which would be kind of cool uh, for him as a rookie. Uh, so that's really, really interesting. Unfortunate for Narvaez if this does end up being the case because he did get off to a great start to the season, looked good, and hopefully it's not really a long-term thing. Uh, but how about that? If it were to be the case, Tyler McGill thrown to Francisco Alvarez at the Mets home opener for 2023. That's a, that's a pretty cool story. That is a cool story, and hopefully he has a storybook part of that story where he just goes off and becomes the next great New York Mets catcher. But who knows? Baseball's crazy, a lot of expectations, but that is at least exciting for those uh, home fans coming out. Yeah, and if I'm looking at this schedule right, which who knows if I am, I might be missing something. Do the Mets not play the Marlins again until August? I don't know. Is this the last time we see? I'm just double checking to confirm. I don't think the Mets see the Marlins again until September, actually. Which, if you can believe that, that's crazy. Uh, so uh, that's good. Hey, one more piece of news. So, uh, Mets beat writer Tim Healy, you yes. are familiar with. Great, love Tim Healy. Follow at Tim B. Tim B. Healy uh, at Twitter. Uh, the Mets will wear a New York Presbyterian patch on their uniforms mm. as part of a new deal with the hospital. Uh, also part of the deal, babies born at New York Presbyterian. New York Presbyterian uh, will get a Mets onesie. So, oh, that's nice. You know, we got the the ADT patch on the on the Marlins. Now the Didn't Mets will that. have a New York Presbyterian. It is what it is. Like, it's one of those on. things where you're going to see it for the first time and be like, oh, and then you're going to forget that it it's there. It doesn't bother me. I, I, I don't like it, but it is what it is. You're going to have it. I will say um, it kind of it lends itself to the joke that the Mets are injury prone if they have a hospital patch on their sleeve. You I'm know? confused by the New York Presbyterian because the Mets team doctors are all at uh, HSS, the hospital oh. for special surgery. So do you think there's beef right now? Yeah, I think we might see a, a battle royale between two <laughs> hospitals. That's not battle where it want, out. It's that's not where you field. want a battle royale to take place, Jerry. Well, at but, least you know if they do get hurt, they can take care of each other. That's true. They're right there. They're already at the hospital, so that's good. <laughs> all right. I think that's all we got for this episode of Shea Station. Hopefully, we get a series win, and we could be a little bit more peppy by this time next week. Yeah. Even I just want to see some some good baseball, some competitive games. Game three was nice in Milwaukee. Uh, it didn't end the well, but they played better. So yeah. as long as you play good baseball, we'll we'll handle. Francisco Alvarez, if you do play, hit a home run. Have a moment. So he'll at least play against Trevor Rogers. I imagine right? he'll play. Got to give him that yeah. matchup. I don't know. Call him up. Let him Let him catch all of them. I don't care. Tomas, if he's here, if he's here let him run? catch, man. Let him why catch. not? Let him play. Let him eat. Call Brett Beatty, too. Why not? We'll see you guys <laughs> next time for another episode of Shea Station. Take care. Let's go Mets. Let's go Mets. <laughs> <laughs>